This week I want us to shift into insects that damage the, the crop more directly, uh, that feed on the part of the plant we're trying to market. So direct injuries being something that feeds on the fruit rather than say the, the leaves that produce the fruit. And probably the best insect to start with uh, in, in this regard would be Helicoverpazia, a notorious insect in North America with an extraordinary wide range of, of plants with effects. Um, in fact, it is the only insect that the Entomological Society of America has given three separate names to, all legitimate names. Corneorum is the best and most widely used name for this, and, and that reflects its importance in corn, including sweet corn. But if it's in a fruiting vegetable, say a tomato or a, a green pepper, it's tomato fruit worm. And in cotton, it's one of the more co important cotton pests. There it's known as the bollworm. All the same insect, Helicoverpazia. But sweet corn is probably where we're most often going to encounter it. And in sweet corn, uh, problems arise when the plants get colonized by the adult moths uh, laying eggs and, and sweet corn becomes attractive when it's in the green silk stage. The eggs are laid at night by the moths. The moth is indicated in the upper left. It's a buff colored uh, moth, uh, cutworm family, fairly standard in size, uh, flying at night, and a strong flyer. I mean, capable of flying miles per evening and capable of very long distance flights. I mean, sometimes infestations here in Colorado uh, originate from moss that came up from Texas. So in co sweet corn the crop is ignored except for a fairly brief period when the green silks are on the plant and the eggs are laid there, the eggs hatch there, the larvae feed on the silks for a few days but then uh, move directly into the ear tip and then produce the kind of injury that I think we all recognize. So this would be the common caterpillar you'd find on sweet, sweet corn ear tip. Notice the color range that you see with this. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, you don't see many kinds of caterpillars that can look so variable. It could be nearly black, it could be nearly red, it could be green. It's all the same insect. The, the larger picture shown right here is uh, the caterpillars I took out of a dozen ears of sweet corn last summer. So, highly variable. Um, however, one thing you will not see uh, very often is two of them together in the ear tip of sweet corn because they are cannibalistic. And often if two are put together, one of them will eat the other. So they go into the ear tip and produce the kind of injury that uh, is, is so uh, damaging to the, the plant. It, it can be quite a mess in the, in the ear tip there. And again, before they get there, they're exposed for only a brief period of time. So this causes complications in how we manage corn earworm. Since it's going to be exposed on the exterior for only a brief period, then any treatments we apply for this will have to be applied during that brief period, at least if we're uh, spraying the whole crop rather than individual ears. Now, one thing in this crop is that sweet corn is attractive for only a, a, a relatively brief period from the time the silks are green first first come out until the silks turn brown so there is uh, some window uh, reflected there again once they become brown uh, no more eggs would be laid on this. The caterpillars that are already in it will continue to feed, but no new eggs will be laid. So timing treatments for this and this crop, for this insect and this crop, uh, can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, and uh, one other thing that helps with it, at least in terms of helping determine if you have a high risk or low risk situation, is pheromone traps. I mentioned this a little bit in the past. And these would be traps that have as a lure a pheromone, in this case the pheromone being the sex pheromone produced by the female corn earworm to attract a male. And these are put in fairly special traps for this kind of insect. Now, most other insects that we use pheromone traps for, it's a sticky trap. So uh, the bottom of it will have some sort of sticky surface, the moth flies in and gets caught. That is not adequate for a corn earworm. It's, it's too strong a flyer, so they might fly into a sticky trap and maybe get a leg a little stuck, but then pull themselves right out. Uh, 
So you have to use one that actually physically captures them and what is used is a kind of a cone trap. It's called the Heliothus trap and it essentially has the lure placed at the bottom. There's an opening at the bottom of the trap. The moths attracted to that tend to move upward and then you funnel them into a collecting container at the top. Uh, the one on the right uh, is more likely what you would see being used. The one on the left is a specialty uh, uh, special trap that was was built out of mesh. Um, so this insect in in corn, it, we call it the corn earworm, and we see the variation in color, so brown and a green one. You also see variation in color on other other plants. So tomato, this would be the tomato fruit worm, and you could use the pheromone traps to tell you. Uh, in any of these crops if the insect was in high abundance or not. Uh, if you have few or no moss being caught in the trap then this is lo there's low risk of it uh, of, of eggs being laid at that time but if you see peaks that is a, a, a warning that would indicate you might want to uh, intensify the kinds of controls that you have. And since some of you are interested in hemp uh, corn earworm is probably the, the most important insect pest of outdoor grown hemp uh, in North America. Um, it, it, it will uh, ream the uh, buds of the, the crop, uh, in particular CBD types of, of hemp, uh, and a single caterpillar can damage uh, several buds in the course of its development. So we've had uh, outbreaks uh, fairly frequently here in southeast Colorado where uh, growers have lost uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases so far. And this insect has damaged this crop from coast to coast, from California to Virginia. People have noticed this happening. Again, an insect of extraordinarily uh, wide host range and wide geographic range. Just in hemp, uh, it, it does, as in every other crop, show a lot of variation in color. Uh, this would be the same thing as I've already shown you in tomato and in corn. One question that's not quite resolved is, is exactly what stage the plant has to be in to be attractive. Uh, I've observed uh, plants in fields that are at various growth stages and, and only some of the plants were, were affected. Uh, so that still needs to be figured out, so come back in a couple years, maybe that will be identified. There is a pest management plan that we've been using here since uh, 2017 and you could find that at the hemp insect website but basically it's adapted from sweet corn and it uses a pheromone trap to uh, monitor the populations of the adult moss because that reflects the amount of egg laying that's going to happen so you start monitoring in the middle of summer when the crop becomes more susceptible in September you monitor uh, 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 very intensely to see if there's any spikes and some years we do see spikes and that would indicate uh, risk of, of infestation, uh, serious damage, and if you don't see any, uh, you're off the hook. So last year, for instance, uh, uh, we had traps in eight different locations in the state, and only two of them uh, did we see high numbers where it indicated a an outbreak. The kinds of things you could use on hemp or you could use on organically grown sweet corn would mostly be microbial products. Um, so there are viruses that are uh, effective against corn earworm and uh, Helicovex would be one uh, of these products but these are very widely used in organic sweet corn. We've talked a little about Bacillus thuringiensis and Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt is perhaps best known to as a, as a microbe that's used to control caterpillars but notice on the left here it says Bacillus thuringiensis Azawi strain there's two common strains of Bt used for caterpillars. Most of them are the Kerstaki strain. The Azawi strain, that works better on cutworms. So the corn earworm is a kind of climbing cutworm, so that would be a product that would be uh, usually far more effective than the standard Bt for caterpillars if you had that kind of pest. Which brings us to climbing cutworms. I mean, we've talked about climbing cutworms a couple of weeks ago and uh, corn earworm would be a type of climbing cutworm and uh, other climbing cutworms uh, 
might just be feeding on foliage, but there are some that feed on foliage and fruits and flowers, or primarily fruits and flowers. The variegated cutworm would be one of these. So this might be feeding on foliage, but you might see it going right into a bud, or in the picture on the right, uh, being found in a tomato fruit. The group I, I briefly alluded to, called green fruit worms, are climbing cutworms that are associated with several kinds of fruit crops. And these will often feed on part of a developing fruit, as indicated in these two slides. And the fruit may then abort uh, if the damage is too extreme, the, the fruit is so small. But if it continues to grow, you can imagine what will then happen, that the, the area of this chewing wound will uh, not grow and it will show up as a kind of dimpled area as indicated in the picture on the right. Now, in a little later, uh, we'll talk about insects with sucking mouth parts that make little wounds in developing fruit, and you get a different kind of dimple. Uh, we call it cat facing. And, uh, but this, this would be a kind of symptom you'd see if, if a caterpillar chewed, a big chunk, and then you get kind of a, a roundish, um, a fairly deeply sunken area that the fruit would uh, develop with. And one that's of interest to me, I'm not sure if it's interest to many other people, is uh, called the tomatillo fruitworm. If any of you ever grow tomatillos, then you'll find a caterpillar in those that may look very much like a corn earworm, uh, but it is a different insect. It is specific in the genus Phasalis, which tomatillo and uh, some related plants are. And anyway, just a curiosity, something uh, I, I work with some. And it also leads me to talk about another insect uh, that is in the same genus, known as the tobacco budworm. And this is a very important insect nationally as well. Uh, it has got a fairly recent uh, scientific name change. Uh, if you ever look up articles on tobacco budworm, most all of them will call it Heliothus fluorescens. Uh, the genus has recently been changed to Chloridium. This is mostly an insect on flowers, uh, not so much on vegetable and fruit crops, but since they're so closely related, I think this might be the best time to bring this insect up. So tobacco budworm is, again, one of these night-flying cutworm moths, fairly similar to uh, the um, tomatillo fruit worm and also fairly similar to the corn earworm. Kind of a, a light, uh, kind of brownish green. Lays its eggs uh, on various host plants, on a petunia there on the left, on geraniums there on the right. And the eggs hatch and you get a caterpillar. And a very common habit, and one that lends its name budworm, is that they will tunnel directly into the buds. And they will uh, feed primarily on the more nutrient-rich developing uh, flower structures of the bud rather than the petals. So they might go in and then back out and you might just see a bud that has a hole in the side. And that's classic budworm kind of attack. Uh, as the caterpillars get older, in a single evening they may feed on a variety of buds uh, uh, and uh, destroy perhaps a whole cluster in the case of a geranium here. And a common complaint we'll get when these start to build in numbers in a, uh, in a garden is, is people complain that the plants are failing to color. They just went out of color. And that's because so many of the developing buds are damaged. On other kinds of flowers, the pattern of attack might be a little different. You could see them going in, again, feeding on the developing uh, uh, flower structures. Uh, but they also will feed on the petals, so there might be extensive damage uh, to petals on, on, again, something like a petunia. Notice again, by the way, the white ra wide range in color with this insect, like we saw with the corn earworm. This is a highly variable caterpillar in terms of color. So a petunia patch here, uh, this shows the two kinds of injuries. You can see several of the flowers have a little hole on the side where the caterpillar went in on the side, but also the petals look quite ragged, and that would indicate uh, a, a period of, of some petal feeding as well. So it'll feed on both the petals and go into the flower structures. 
some other pictures of it. Here it is damaging Nicotiana, or here it is on Verbena. Now this is an insect that is primarily southern uh, North America and it is one that where I live we are kind of at the edge. Uh, so we see it but uh, the incidence of, of this insect is usually correlated to previous winters uh, since it's uh, imperfectly adapted where I live here in, in Colorado. Um, so we tend to see tobacco budworm outbreaks tracking with the previous winter. So they tend to be worse following a mild winter. They tend to uh, diminish if the previous winter was quite cold. It's because the pupa, the overwintering stage of this insect, which occurs in the soil at a depth of a couple inches, can't stand temperatures below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So if it does reach 20 degrees Fahrenheit where the pupae are, they will be killed. And that regularly happens uh, in this part of the country, but doesn't in the south. There are various insecticides that work on tobacco budworm, the pyrethroids, uh, spinosad. These are, these are the standards that we see now for uh, control of this insect. Um, and some work and some don't. You can see on the right that worked, on the left it didn't. Many homeowners uh, might just want to hand pick though and not deal with sprays. Uh, hand picking uh, is best done at night you can find these caterpillars on the daytime, but they'll be far more at night. They will hide during the day, many of them uh, at the base of the plant. So go out at night, one of the insects that might be good to check uh, for with a headlamp or flashlight, and then pick them off at that time. And some uh, cultivars are less susceptible than others. Among geraniums, uh, a, a kind of plant that is heavily damaged here, we, in fact we call it the geranium budworm, uh, the standard geraniums are, are very susceptible, but the ivy geraniums without the, uh, without the sticky uh, foliage are, are not uh, susceptible to, to this insect at all. So anyway, uh, a tobacco budworm, mostly something we perhaps should talk in the next course about when we talk about ornamental plants, but so closely related to the corn earworm and some of the other climbing cutworms. I thought it was a good, good one to stick in now. So that's it with this one, and then next we'll do codling moth.